so grateful to be with you all tonight um, to talk about the practice of prayer offered in faith. Um, let us begin with a, a moment of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing us all here together to study your word, to grow in knowledge and wisdom and understanding of your spirit, of your will. Um, thank you, oh God, for this opportunity to share with my church family. And I pray that it will be a moment of encouragement, a moment of challenge, and a moment of confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want us to begin with looking at Matthew 21, 18 to 22, and the new international version. And this passage is going to be the anchor for our devotional tonight. And it will tie into two other um, passages that I would like to read as well. So it begins with Jesus curses the fig tree. Early in the morning, as Jesus and his, was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So in the first verse, we see that there are natural circumstances that are almost commonplace and easy to overlook. The passage introduces us to Jesus in his physical condition as hungry. And if the fig tree bore fruit like Jesus expected him to, then we wouldn't be talking about this moment today. But instead, to Jesus' disappointment and frustration over finding no fruit to eat, he spoke a word of destruction over the fig tree. Here we are standing about a week away from the crucifixion. And Jesus used his authority to curse a tree. One of only a handful of moments that I can recall where Jesus used his sovereign power for destruction. The other one that comes to mind would be, for example, the legion of demons that was cast into 2,000 pigs who ran down a steep hill and drowned themselves in the lake, which we see in Mark 5. But why would Jesus curse a fig tree? Why would a fig tree deserve this? I mean, I understand the demons, but not quite much the tree. Until I reflect back on some parables that Jesus has used to teach his disciples and those who followed him. A parable that we can find in Luke chapter 13, verse 10. 
And I'm going to paraphrase this parable for us. Essentially, there is a vineyard. And there's a master of this vineyard who has been watching a fig tree that was planted in the soil bear no fruit for three years. And he was up to, he was frustrated with the tree. He was about ready to top it down, throw it in the fire, and just be done with it. Why should it waste any more soil? But to the benefit of this fig tree, the vine dresser interceded on its behalf. It pleaded with the, the master of the vineyard, begging that it would take extra care of the fig tree, adding more manure, digging trenches, extra water, until hopefully on the fourth year, it could produce fruit. The promise being that if it does not, on the fourth try, the master would go ahead and cut down the tree. So you see, in chapter 13 of Luke, the fig tree is revered, but in Matthew 21, it is utterly destroyed. And if you look throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are so many symbols of the fig tree being used. So I began to think that perhaps there are symbolisms to this fig tree, a spiritual message or teaching that we can learn. And so I listened to a few sermons on YouTube, uh, read some articles online, Places like One for Israel, an evangelical group that's focusing on trying to spread the, um, the salvation of Yeshua, Jesus, to Israelites. Or a Southern California church called Calvary Chapel. And essentially, to sum it up, they said that the fig tree is a symbol of Israel's spiritual maturity. It determined whether or not it, they were prepared to receive the promise of the Messiah. So perhaps we could read into that in Matthew 21 and see that maybe it's a commentary on how the Jewish community and Israel were not yet ready to receive the promise of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, we certainly could go that way. Jesus could have taught it in that direction. He does it in Luke chapter 13. We see it all throughout the list of parables. He does that with the sowing of the mustard seed. He does it with the narrow door. He does it with his sorrow for Jerusalem parable. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I long to gather you like a hand gathers her chicks. But instead, he takes it in a different direction. He focuses on his disciples' lack of faith. Again, in verse 21, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to the mountain, go, pour yourself into the sea and it will be done. Jesus emphasizes this point with the word truly. And it is beneficial for us to try to sit in the gravity of this word, of his words today. You see, his disciples had contention in their hearts. They were doubting Jesus. And I wanna get back to this, but for now, let us just grasp the fact that Jesus used this moment to teach his disciples. Instead of using this moment as a stark rebuke on the Pharisees and the circumstances that will soon fall on his life. But for this moment, I want us to read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And I'll be reading this from the New King, King James Version. And it says, by faith we understand. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by its elders obtained good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the thing which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Fate at the dawn of history says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though he being dead, still speaks. 
By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. But before he was taken, he had this testimony that he, was, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, Hebrews is an incredible book because it essentially provides evidence or proof for which our faith stands on. And even though we do not know who the author of Hebrew is, there's all the debate around who it might be exactly. We know that he assumes a certain knowledge of the Old Testament from the reader. We know that Potentially, he is speaking to a Christian community, freshly born in faith, who are having the challenge now of trying to walk in that faith. And he's trying to make arguments for them to solidify their faith in Jesus Christ. So he goes back to... And most of these um, Christians might be Jewish at this time. He'll go back to the Old Testament and write for them the retelling of their story. How God, at every moment of their past, was performing miracles through their faith of the elders. You see, back then, it would be very contentious in the Christian community because the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians had different practices, cultural practices, not spiritual practices. And for the Jewish community who are so strongly founded um, on their rules and their understanding of the Old Testament, they could not see how faith can operate in the lives of those who have never known God, the Gentiles. And in this moment, there was a lot of turning away from faith. Pardon my dog. Um, but but Instead of being hindered by these challenges of doubt that were about to rise up in the Christian community, Hebrews is teaching us to redirect ourselves and realize that we are standing on faith alone. I want to tie this back into Matthew 21, verse 21 to 22. Again, remember Jesus is telling and responding to the disciples' lack of faith, their doubt, as by saying, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask for in prayer. See, Jesus has a knack of revealing truths to his disciples that cannot be seen. He makes it an effort effort to emphasize this point that it is by faith that they are about to pursue and complete the task that God has prepared for them. Remember, this is a week or a week, about a week before Jesus is crucified on the cross, before he dies, before he rises again from death three days later and ascends into heaven. And he sees in his disciples still these hindrance of doubt and contention that will challenge them in the task that they would need to achieve on their own. Because Jesus won't be with them forever. In fact, his disciples will be soon left alone. And if they do not grow quickly in their spiritual maturity, just as quickly as that fig tree withered and died before their eyes, they wouldn't be prepared 
to bring the message of the salvation of the Messiah to the rest of the world. See, the mountain is this Im Im immeasurable obstacle that stands before us and stood before them back then. And even though now, 2000 years later, reading back on these, um, this scripture and these passages, we can think highly of ourselves and say that these men who obviously should have known by now, walking with God for so long that he can perform incredible miracles. He, they saw the, him rise Lazarus from the dead. They saw him turn water to wine, but still even a week before he dies, they're still baffled by how quickly his words have authority to bring forth natural phenomena, to bring to pass what he says. So God has to teach them that if they believe, even if it's just the faith of a, of a mustard seed, then they would, would be able to speak to a mountain, the impossible task before them, and have it thrown into the sea. The path would be made clear for them. It already was prepared for them to walk. To bring it back into a personal analogy, for example, um, through my spiritual walk with Jesus Christ, um, growing up with my grandfather pe preaching in Anguilla and my dad preaching and continuing to preach in St. Thomas, um, you begin to rely on to know and to be experience certain things about our Christian walk, right? You begin to believe in the promises of God, the ones written in the Old Testament and the New. You begin to believe in the power of salvation. You begin to see people be saved. And that reinforces those, those acts of faith, those miracles that occur in our everyday life. You see the perseverance of saints through testimony, how God performed one way or the other for people when they needed him most, when they were grieving a lost loved one, when they were going through sickness or financial difficulties, the list could go on and on. But personally, right, even though I knew all this, I had contention in my heart. I didn't believe God could fully achieve love in my life through companionship or to introducing um, my wife, but then it happened, right? And then after I took that other step in faith and realized, okay, so God is capable of producing my physical needs to cater to things that I am struggling with or that um, are teaching me about my desires and my walk in this side of heaven you begin to have another doubt in God's capability to provide for you financially in an immeasurable way. Yes, you've heard testimonies from others about how God saved them from huge amounts of debt or how God taught them to save and to invest and to walk day by day financially in hand in hand with God. But when it comes to a big obstacle, like in this case, acquiring a green card, which costs a lot of money. And back then I, I, I had no money at all. It becomes an impossible to reason how God can do that for you okay, personally, even though you've heard others say so before. But then it happens. And then your faith grows again. And then you realize, okay, so God is able to provide for my physical needs, my financial needs. What else can God do, right? So when I've heard that my great aunt, LP, was um, suffering from a stroke or suffered from a stroke, um, I was shocked. Um, confused and 
horrified, concerned, heavily concerned that a person I've known to be a symbol of strength my whole life, someone who I've seen pick herself up time and time again and just handle her, bit, her business um, without relying on anyone. I couldn't wrap my mind around that individual having to rely on people in the last years of her life. But then my mind reflected back on a time when I was in high school and at our church in St. Thomas, we had a member who tragically suffered a stroke also back then. And I remember we laid hands on her and anointed her with oil and we prayed for her. And slowly through months, she recovered. And so now again, even though I've heard the medical reports that she had semi-paralysis and it's not certain how, if it, um, if, how long it would take or if it might be permanent, I began to think about that time, just like in Hebrews when the Jewish Christian community thought back on the elders and the walk of faith and how God came through for them. And then I, be I began to think, well, if God is capable of doing it back then, he has the capacity to do it again. But what I didn't expect was how quickly he could perform it this time around, how quickly my aunt could recover. But I'm happy that it happened this way because now I'm more confident that in faith, God can accomplish things through our life that go beyond our theology, our religious philosophy, our spiritual apprehensions, our expectations of what he, what seasons or times or any way we can measure um, him coming through for us, right? All that to say is that through my personal life, God has been gracious to me. And reflecting on these passages, um, I know that if you also look back at your time, and your spiritual walk with Jesus, you will realize he was also gracious to you. And he was gracious to us because just like in Matthew 21, he wanted to teach us, his disciples, the importance of faith and not doubt. Circumstances, both physical or spiritual, or can, um, can cause us to brew contention in our heart or face challenges that seem in opposition to our faith. And if we allow ourselves to be hindered by these natural doubts, then we are doing ourselves a disservice. Because even though it is natural to doubt, it is displeasing to God. So our faith and our prayer life should always begin with this one understanding, this one truth that I think comes very clearly through Matthew 21. Faith, our faith is grafted on Jesus Christ alone. Everything we have witnessed in the past and everything we hope or desire for God to achieve in our churches, in our personal lives, in our communities, in our nation for the future begins with us starting in the present moment walking with Christ in faith and trusting in his words and his promises. Because when we begin to start on that foot, the reality of our circumstances and what we're going through in our daily life begins to morph, to change. I'll bring it to an analogy that 
is often used in philosophy. And that's the, the analogy of Plato's cave. So essentially, the theory is that there are people who have lived their entire life in a cave, and all they know of reality are the shadows that display themselves on the cave's wall. But one individual finally got the courage to venture out of the cave and into the sun light. And at first he is blinded by this new phenomenon. The light of the sun rays are too intense, but as his eyes adjust to the brilliance of the sun, he begins to experience a reality outside of the cave that is more vivid, more potent, more phenomenal than he has ever experienced back then. Now, of course, it goes on to talk about how he tries to go back and convince others in the cave to come out and experience this with him and how they could not fully be convinced that what he saw was true. But I just want to pause for the moment on the fact that of, of his experience outside the cave. The fact that his reality has completely shifted from that one choice to walk out. To bring it back into biblical terms, let's go back to the road of Damascus. Let's go back to when Paul was zealously persecuting Christians and he became blinded by Jesus's light. And only after he is prayed for and the scales of his eyes fall off, does he enter into a more vivid, more consuming truth than he knew and experienced. This is the essence of our prayer life through faith. Every time we begin again to enter and be redirected, allow God to redirect us back to standing on faith alone and not just our reasoning, we are able to renew our reality, our perspective of reality and align ourselves with God so that he can achieve through us great and miraculous miracles. So I want to close with James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. And it says, But when you ask, you must believe and not, and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Amen. So God, thank you so much for this time um, in devotion with you and our church community. Thank you for allowing us to be redirected into standing alone on faith and to align ourselves with your will and your purpose. Help us, the God, as we wrap up these final days of the Daniel Fast to prepare in us the spiritual te teachings that you have in order for us to accomplish the goals that you have set before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, awesome job, man. Awesome job. Awesome delivery. Move. I have a new perspective on faith. Carlo. God bless everyone. Yeah.